Hey guys, welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. My name is Brian. And my name is Maggie. And we interview Asian entrepreneurs around the world to amplify their voices and empower Asians to pursue their dreams and goals. We believe that each person has a message and a unique story from their entrepreneurial journey that they can share with all of us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today, we have four special guests with us. Bao Tran, the writer, director, and editor of The Paper Tigers, starring Elaine Ui, Ran Yuan, and Mikhail Shannon Jenkins. The Paper Tigers tells the story of three kung fu prodigies, Danny, played by Elaine, Hing, played by Ron, and Jim, played by Mikhail, who have grown up into washed up, middle-aged men who are just one kick away from pulling their hamstrings. When their master is murdered, they must juggle their dead-end jobs, dad duties, and old grudges to avenge his death. Mentored early on by master action director Corey Yuan, director Bao Tran was instilled with an approach to action that doesn't rely solely on spectacle, but also draws on story and character. His editing credits include Cholan, one of Southeast Asia's highest budgeted action blockbusters, and Jackpot, a heartfelt comedy selected as Vietnam's official entry to the 2016 Oscars for Best Foreign Film. From bringing diverse and dynamic characters to life on screen, to flexing his entrepreneurial spirit through his production company, Them Too, multi-hyphenate actor, director, producer, and writer, Elaine Ui, has become one to watch in the entertainment industry, and he isn't slowing down anytime soon. Born in Dagupan City, Philippines, and of Chinese-Filipino descent, Elaine moved to Los Angeles at six years old with his parents and four siblings. Growing up, he had an innate love for the arts. Elaine trained to be a professional dancer in high school and was led to a study abroad program at Oxford University in the UK. There, Elaine immersed himself in theater, and when he returned to the States, he began his professional career as an actor. Ron Yuan just wrapped as one of the ensemble leads in Disney's live adaptation Mulan, directed by Nikki Caro. Yuan plays battle-hardened Master Sergeant Chiang, second in command of the Imperial Regiment. Yuan signed on as series regular Prince Nyon on Netflix's Marco Polo, created by John Fusco. Yuan filmed Roland Emmerich's Independence Day, Resurgence playing Yang, the main weapons engineer. Before that, he was in The Accountant, directed by Gavin O'Connor, playing a reluctant Silit master. He appeared on John Bokenkamp's The Blacklist as Chuan Zhang. Yuan played hard-nosed Lieutenant Peter Kang, in the short-lived CBS series, Golden Boy, and had small roles in episodes of Justified and Castle. Yuan's award-winning work in short film and features has premiered in more than 30 film festivals worldwide. Mikael Shannon Jenkins, born in Biloxi, Mississippi, to an officer in the United States Air Force, traveled with his family across the United States. With his parents and two siblings, Mikael finally settled in New Orleans, Louisiana, where he landed many roles, including one that earned him screen time with Tommy Lee Jones and Ashley Judd in Double Jeopardy. Since moving to Hollywood, Mikael has landed leads in many highly regarded television shows. In 2015, instead of waiting for an opportunity, Mikael created his own by writing, producing, directing, and starring in his own films. Mikael is currently writing a script, which he will produce, direct, and co-star, spotlighting his son in a coming-of-age dramedy about a young boy finding his way through the craziness of life, friendships, and family. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for, thank thank you. for having us. Thank you. We're so happy. Asian in the house. Of course. <laughs> happy to have you guys here today. And we want to kind of hop into, and just let Dal talk quickly about the movie, you know, what the inspiration behind it was, and what was the filming process like? Where did you guys film the movie? Yeah, well, uh, we shot uh, this basically all in Seattle. This is where I'm based. Uh, the Paper Tigers is um, kind of loosely based and inspired by the history uh, that we have in our region. Uh, if you may or may not know, Bruce Lee, when he first came to America, he set down his digs first uh, in Seattle. He met his wife here and he uh, start, opened his first Kung Fu school and he studied at the University of Washington. Uh, so a lot of his uh, footprint is definitely felt around the city. He's also buried here, of course. Uh, so we all felt that just growing up and understanding, you know, in the martial arts uh, world, we had a, a whole lot of us students are still have schools and actively teaching. So uh, a lot of that is, is kind of imbued in, in our in our region here. So it, it was a partly just kind of paid tribute to that history of Seattle, but also uh, our own martial arts history of, you know, my own growing up in this region also and then making the friends that I'd made and also a tribute to the friendships that, you know, that I still have to this day. 
So that's kind of in a nutshell, the whole kind of um, backdrop of the film. And just um, hopefully it's just kind of reflects also the period of the 90s and also just the friendships that we've made over the time. So uh, not just the martial arts film, but also a, a good buddy flick. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, watching the film, especially at the very beginning, mm-hmm. remind me a lot of like a Hong Kong film back in like the 1990s where growing up, I was, I was really into martial arts. I was really into that theme and seeing that throughout the entire movie, especially the beginning, I was like, whoa, what a major flashback. I was wondering what God's inspiration was, you know? And the cast that you have right here, it's, it's, they're absolutely amazing. You know, the three targets in front of us. <laughs> you know? um, I, I just want to hear about, you know, each person here and we'll kind of just go in order. So I see Ron first. Talk about like you know, your character inside the movie. You know, who, who was it? Like, what was it like playing this character and how to tie back into your own personality and personal experience? Um, uh, I'm Ron. I play the character of Hing. Um, it's uh, one of the comedy reliefs, and I was really, really fat, <laughs> uh, almost seventy pounds over. Um, but, uh, but no. Um, I think what drew me to Bao's wonderful script was, you know, n- not just the story itself, but as far as the character Hing, I felt like this guy like used comedy to hide his sadness and, and, his, and his pain from missing his brothers, from his guilt with his Sifu. So when I read the script, like it just flowed like butter for me. So, you know, it was um, a producer, uh, Yuji Okamoto, who, who been friends and he asked me to take a look at the script. I'm like, dude, I'm down. I love it. And, um, and as far as me meeting the rest of the guys, it was like, it, it felt like, you know, like just after a couple of days, we were bros, you know, and, and we all really, really bonded and, and we loved like working together on scene. So like the journey, the journey for me as an actor uh, is probably one of my best experiences because at Bao is a truly, you know, an actress director. And also just he let us play. He let us because he knew that we were going to be bringing stuff and he just allowed us to breathe and, and, and just take chances and stuff. And and uh, it, from that aspect it was a wonderful experience mm-hmm. yeah it really reflected like the comic relief and all the jokes <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. i was wondering like are you guys really getting hurt behind the scenes because we saw you kick a bunch of stuff and oh my leg i'm like it looks pretty real man <laughs> like i'm not sure if we really got injured or not yeah i, I think did. some of us did didn't we we all took a little nicks and, yeah yeah <laughs> i just no, want to point out i used to a gun and some oil <laughs> <laughs> Well, no. Well, I would make these guys come with me and like go to Ding Tai Phone because I was still trying to gain weight. Yeah, I told you. Because because Bao made me feel guilty. She's like, you're not fat enough. Man. You're not fat enough. It's like Elaine's really thin, so you need to be really fat. Like, all right. So even when we were up in Seattle, like guys, come on. So I put extra soy sauce, extra salt on everything, just blow it out. So yeah. <laughs> I also wanted to point out, you know, in the movie, in the beginning, when you guys had all reconnected, Elaine and Mikel, we didn't really end off on good terms. And Ron, you kind of came in and was like the centerpiece and like the middleman to kind of like bring everyone together. So that was like really refreshing to see. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things I, I loved about the screenplay, because you have like these three really great characters independently and they all have baggage and for yeah. them to find the bonding thing that drew them together as kids, you know, it's, I mean, we do that in real life, man. You, you know, even, even till like, I see 80 year olds arguing like in families and stuff, it's just, it's, and so yeah, it, it just read true to me from day one. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Mikhail, let's, let's hear from your experience. How's it, how's it like playing the character Jim? Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, as soon as I got the script from Bao, I read Jim and I was like, that's me. Like, straight up, that's me. Like, uh, most of the time I'm like 40 pages deep in backstory and all that. I'm like, this guy is me. So I have to meet Val and tell him so we can do this thing. So, because it was so, the script was so, screenplay was just, um, I don't think that we, we see enough we don't see enough in the media, or at least films made, where men are allowed to care for each other as deeply as these brothers do. And uh, to throw it back to the code of just honor and 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 decency and what's good, what's good, 
uh, it was naturally good. And everyone was, was a throwback for me. Like I haven't seen that done in a minute either. Just reminding people what's important. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as a brother, uh, to see that he, that at, by the last page, he's still alive. I was like, yo, that's a plus. Um, <laughs> I'm still, kick, still kicking. And so um, I, I was turned on from the second I read it. And then I met Val and our audition went for an hour and a half. And I was like, oh, Lord, have mercy. I love this dude. Like, cause he just kept giving it. And I was like, we can go all day. Like, I don't want to, I don't ever want this to end. Mm-hmm. Then we, uh, then I, then I freaked out because I read it and I turned to my wife. And I said, this can be a classic or this can be really not good because there are a lot of moments that have to be done right. I cannot wait to meet these two brothers and my so, so as soon as I come into this room, it's like, there's some people, there's about 20 people in there. And I'm trying to figure out who the two are. Mm-hmm. And I guess completely wrong. <laughs> Bao is like putting people together to do like some ad lib scenes. And I'm like, oh, she's So luckily I, I was last and he put those two together. Mm-hmm. And boy, they start cooking. And Bao started working. I'm like, well, oh, I have changed my position in my seat. Are we doing that? We we doing that? Oh, so we <laughs> doing? Call my wife from that little set. I'm like, this is gonna be bananas. It's gonna be classic, loud. Mm-hmm. And it took me like two days. Normally, when I arrive on the set, I I keep to myself, especially when I don't know people and I don't know the environment. I've never been to Seattle, and just but so much love from the time I got picked up from the airport. And these guys are just um, probably the first actors I've ever worked with that weren't like, but they just wanted to do what was best for the, for the piece. Like, we mm-hmm. just grind it all the time, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I love that we wait for each other to get off and catch the same ride. Like, I really have an extraordinary amount of love for both of these men. I wouldn't, there's nothing I wouldn't do for them. The relationship um, that we generated through the gift of this project has remained with me for the rest of, and will remain with me for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, so to get on a set and have somebody like Bao basically just open it up and let us just like express ourselves. Like it was, a, it was, I've never really been a part. Most people try and control the magic and then tell you when it's supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. And he controlled the environment and let the magic happen. And so like, definitely my favorite project. I've been doing this for 30 some years and it's just, it's just an experience that I go back to mm-hmm. all the time. And um, it reminds me, like there's those moments in life when you're like, yeah, you're doing the thing you want to do your whole life. And you knew it could be done the way this is being put together. Mm-hmm. Just people sometimes won't let it happen that way. And mm-hmm. the, and all credit to Saran and Lane and about like, uh, you know, I was African American there for a minute and like I'm surrounded by all this love and warmth of people who aren't my color. And it's just like crazy for a Southern kid like myself. Such a learning situation. Now it's just like I'm trying to get people to see which Elaine, Ron, we used to have talks about the similarities between the cultures. It's just crazy. If we ever talked about, we spent so much time talking about differences, our similarities are like crazy. Like they really are like my brothers. Like I got brothers. They are just like them. So uh, just a magnificent opportunity. And uh, I am Jim. Like, I, I just, it is like, it is what it is. Like, if you follow me throughout my life, you'd be like, yo, you didn't really have to do, you didn't really have to, you just had to be free to, to let his story be told because uh, Jim, you wait your whole life to get an opportunity to be some, to be your, to be the closest thing you can to yourself. Mm-hmm if you know who you are by that time. And Jim is the closest thing. Yeah. I've had the opportunity to play this. That's really like who I am when I, mm-hmm. I walk this planet. I love that. And, and you know, you guys are gonna make me shed, shed a very brotherly tear. Don't hear it, brother, don't hear it. I got to that, brother. Yeah, but I love that though. I think, Mikhail, you, you bring up a really great point. I think we often idolize the fact that like men are very hard and like they don't show emotions. I mean, and it's like true. That. I barely show my emotions. <laughs> 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 but 
<laughs> you know, I love the fact that inside the movie, you guys are not afraid to show emotions and that it's okay for men to show emotions. And, you know, I think that we have to normalize that in yeah. society. Yeah. Yeah. All jokes aside, that is very true. And thanks for showing this other side, you know, mm-hmm. like, like camaraderie and working together and forming this three tigers in real life and the movie. You know, you guys are, you guys are exactly. Cool. <laughs> it's a straight takeover brother it's a takeover yeah so uh I- elaine let's hear more about your experience playing danny you know because you had such a big impactful role at the very beginning single father being there for your kid your seafood the story sort of revolves around you your character as danny let's want to hear more about that it's interesting because you know i was at a point in my life um in 2019 is when we when we really I, I got introduced to the film and the script and reading it and at that point uh, my parents just retired and I had a you know he was four at the time of a four year old I have a six year old son now but he was four at the time and at that point you're sort of in this apex point where you could kind of see the end and then a little bit of the beginning mm-hmm. and your your perspective changes and your priorities change. And that's when things for me as a, as a person, you know, I really had to kind of look at inward and figure out like, what, what am I really looking for? What, 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 uh, am I still striving for that 20 year old gold? I mean, when I was a 20 year old, is that the same thing or is it changing? And here comes a script that really reflects on that in terms of how quickly or how slowly our priorities change and how we in many ways either run away from certain things or we embrace certain things and you kind of see that in in all three tigers where where someone stays in the hing character and someone like uh, you know the jim character that sort of adapts because of survival and then you're left with someone like danny who just kind of in some ways ran away and i thought that to be pretty powerful and really interesting and uh, you know it, it it is in the context or in in a containment that is a martial arts film but it's still a, a story that we all go through as 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 people that you know we do age we get older and things change and and i think that's something that really i gravitated towards and then after after talking to bow about it and and just kind of working it out through the audition process you start to get a sense of like what his vision is and how he wants to put this together. And, you know, my experience uh, in a personal level, you know, playing Danny and kind of breathing life into this character, it was really cathartic in many ways because it, it does put you in a situation where it, it makes you think about your, what's happening in your real life. Mm-hmm. And I, and I thought it was beautiful. I think it, it it's, you know, Danny is a, is, is he's trying his best. Um, and sometimes, you know, he kind of gets in the way of himself. It's like, we talked about it in length uh, uh, during during filming about like how Danny will put, will go one step forward and then two steps back. And it's always because of his own kind of, you know, he's, in, he's mired in his own, uh, you know, crap. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I, it was a joy to kind of breathe life into this character. and. You know, and just I, they've they've all said it. Bao said it. You know, Mikhail and and Ron have said it that it was. This was probably the best experience I've ever had uh, working on a film um, because of the fact that everybody was passionate about the film. Like, you know, you you hear the stories from like uh, you know Yuji and and uh, Alan and 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 everybody that was producing it. Like, you can't help but get infected by the enthusiasm. And, and what's at stake and, 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 you know, and Bao could, we could talk about like the history and how this film came about, but being a part of this journey with everybody and, and seeing it come to fruition is, is, you know, beyond exhilarating. Yeah. Thanks for giving us such an insightful and depth vision <laughs> into your character and your experience playing him. I kind of want to take the, 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 the podcast for its narrative of, Let's talk about representation. You know, representation is such a big thing in mainstream media, especially for Asian Americans. And, you know, I think the movie coming out the way it is in 2021 is 
it's probably the best time for the movie to come out, to be honest. It just shows um, you know, the Black community and the Asian community work together and becoming one family. That's extremely important to right now because more so than ever, not to get too political, I feel like I feel like we're sort of pit against each other at, at the current moment. Mm -hmm. And it's a really uncomfortable feeling, you know? And I, I just want to have you guys kind of speak in the experience, speak in the representation, not only inside the industry and what you guys currently see right now, but the more the importance of building allyship with, with people of color. And this entire movie is about people of color, you know, like what does it mean for the industry and for you guys? Yeah, and just to add on top of that, you know, there is so many things going on with the Asian community and the black community right now, but at the same time, there's so much synergy between the two of them, right? And like how Mikhail said, there are more similarities between the two communities than there are differences, right? And we'd love to know like what your take yeah. is on the representation. Yeah, I wanna hear an open yeah. discussion from you guys. So feel free to chime in. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. I got all the time. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say something really quickly. I think, I think Mikhail really touched on it when we were talking, when he was talking about breaking bread on set. I think it's, it's about sharing those stories, and and you know, it's important to kind of find the similarities and. You know, Mikhail came in there not really knowing about our culture. Um, you know, I, I'll have him speak on it, but it was, I found it interesting, even the food and, and like not knowing exactly what certain <laughs> things are. But by the end of the shoot, we were eating, you know, like we were eating Japanese food and like Korean food. And he was like, yo, I, I can mess with this. This is amazing. And it's it's those kind of moments. But at first, he was like, "Nah, nah, I don't." Really yeah, yeah, he's like, yeah, "Nah." Yeah. Was, <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was very reluctant. You know, it was it was it was you know it was you know I've, I've never met anybody that's never even tasted Asian food. Like it's huh? it's part of the you know the I don't know the experience here in LA. It's just that sort of cultural you know uh, you know melting pot. I hate to use that word use that term, but like. I think for me, you know, when we get to talking and, you know, he understands the plight of, of the struggles that we've been through, it is very similar. Mm -hmm. And it's, isn't it interesting that we are meant to be pitted against each other and to sort of, you know, we're fighting for scraps, like that doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. So when, when, we, when we do start to figure out like, oh, okay, we are moving in the same direction, why can't we all be in the same car? as opposed to two different cars, both stuck in traffic. Let's carpool and get there together and we can share stories. So it's like, I, I thought, you know, in a, in a very, you know, in, a micro, in the microcosm of the experience of the, the, the black experience, the Asian American experience, like how it sort of is similar. I, this movie and everything that happened behind the scenes is a microcosm of that experience. And, and like I said, by the end of that shoot, you know, we, we just became like real brothers and, and really understanding each other and some of the stuff that we've gone through, you know, even Ron, uh, even Mikkel explaining his stories about like, uh, you know, police, like in the stuff that he's experienced with police and even Ron talking about his experience with police, you're like, wait, this is kind of the same, right? So not to put, you know, put, put a, put an, uh, put a antagonist in this thing in terms of police because, but, but it's still a lot of that sharing the stories and, and understanding that that we're all kind of the same. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, without question, I'm just gonna tap on a short truth. For me, um, the Asian community. I mean, I I've never felt more love and um, warmth, and then I mean, I've never walked into a, a set where people don't look there isn't one person there that looks like me and felt so at home. Like it, it was really, I'm a Southern kid. I've been told all the lies. So, you know, like it just was so education, such an educational experience for me because now I get to come back to my community and educate them. Like they don't really get it. They don't really know. They have never been exposed to it. And what we do is we don't expose ourselves to situations so we can stay ignorant. And as long as you stay ignorant, you can hold on to whatever lie you're, choosing to believe. And the problem happens when the worlds collide and you realize none of it is true. Mm -hmm. Like it was like every song that came on the radio, these cats are like singing. I'm like, I grew up on that. Like, it's just crazy. Like I was just really, I had to, every night I went home, I'd call my wife and I'd be like, I've just been lied to my whole life. 
Like, so I just am kind of excited um, for everyone to see this film because what they will see is more than just three actors who came together to perform this project. They will see the genuine love and affection that we have for them. I didn't know these guys. Mm-hmm. I've never been to Seattle. Mm-hmm. Like, so I'm hoping um, that, uh, well, I'm going to have a voice in this whole situation because you're right. When I think about I, it's the first time I ever thought about it, actually, I thought about how poorly Blacks are represented. Right. Mm -hmm. But I never really thought about how poorly Asians are represented. It's like for the first time in my life, I started to look at how many movies like, oh, yeah, you got one black, but there are no Asians. Like you got your token and you made him the black dude. Like he's not the Mexican dude and he's not Asian. And I was like, wow. So while I was worried about the fact that we would get nothing, there are folks actually getting nothing. You know what I mean? So like. That that similarity, that 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 struggle, the truth of it all, just to be properly, and then they started telling about you know, their cinematic representation and how you know Asians are portrayed, and I started watching that trash and thinking to myself, wow, this is just completely not true. Like none of it. It's like they're 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 some of the most brilliant-minded, uh, free, uh, culturally solid people I've ever met in my life. But when you're lost, you don't want to hear that. You know what I mean? And I think um, I'm hoping that uh, this this film becomes like that thing that taps some people on the shoulder and dares them to look at beyond, look beyond the meme, look beyond the Facebook title. Because um, when I speak on it for the rest of my life, and I've already started since I came home with all my crews, like mm-hmm. beautiful. Like uh, um, the food is amazing and the people are beautiful. And like uh, Bruce Lee was about, we all love Bruce. And Bruce. Look what he was about. Like that he represents a whole culture. Like he wasn't just speaking personally. This is, this is, he's a cultural icon. You have to understand that those principles roles are what is true. Like, I don't, I don't know how you get it confused. You, you love this, but you don't, but you don't see that. So, so Paper Tigers dropping right now at this moment, I'm just so, I, I couldn't, like, God is just working it out. He is like, like working it out because everybody knows going to try to find a place to pop in. Mm-hmm. I cannot wait. Like, because for the first time, Asians are represented properly. Like, their love, their honor, their cold, that system, that drew me to the movie like, like nothing else. The cold that we all were not following is the cold we all have in the street. It's the same cold, like that honor. It's the same cold. Right. Like, but they're not thinking. Like, this is the same thing we built everything we built on. It's like, and it's in here. Like, mm-hmm. they're going to see the simulators. I'm going to talk about it. They're going to see right. how stupid we are. They're going to see how easy it is to, to slide over and 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 open yourself up for it. And I think when people see things, this is our job as artists to open up the mind and expand the perspective. When people see that, like when you see it, it's real. When it's just talking, it's well. But when you see it, it's real. And a lot of my brothers, they don't go to school. They watch, they get in school by this. We about to put them in class. That's all. They were talking about to put them in class. You hear me? Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. I cannot. And they're going to come see some Kung Fu now. <laughs> they're going to come see some Kung Fu because... You know, we like to see a whoop. So, like, however it is, they're going to be in there to see some Kung Fu. We're going to school them while they get some Kung Fu. So, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about it. Super excited. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, like, um, it goes back to the script, right? I, I mean, I, I got a lot of things to say about this. But for me, if you take away the martial arts, these are three fully fleshed out characters. They're brothers. We all have our problems. And this is stuff like, you know, when I first came in the business, if there's a martial arts film, it's like, we either got to be triad, Yakuza, mm-hmm. one dimensional bad guys. So what Mikel was saying is right. Like this is, this is really different and for me. When I read Jim was black, it really hit home for me because when I grew up, I grew up in really, you know, racist situations. I was, getting into fights, get beat up, you know, a lot when I was really, really young from like first grade, you know, um, just because I was different in class. But later on, it was 
the black community that embraced me. It was my black brothers that bled for me every time someone said the C word and I bled for them every time someone said the N word. So it was, you know, New York was crazy back then. And I think for me, like it was very touching and like me and Lane talked about, even with Mikel's situation, like learning about Asian food. I dealt with that when I was young because my black brothers, even from the time of third, fourth grade, they would come over like, yo, what the hell is that? Man, I ain't gonna eat that. I just try it, man. Just try it. I tried to like, oh damn, <laughs> you know, it's like one of those things. And when we saw Mikel reacting like that, for me, you know, I don't know about you know, Elaine, but it's just like for me, it was just. I felt like it was going back to my roots, and 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 it was a beautiful thing because today, what's happening now? I mean, I'm even out here in New York, and I was telling the story about Paper Tigers to my crew here. We're doing an anti-Asian hate video, and. And for me, like Paper Tigers, you had POC all over in front of camera, behind camera, even within the Asian, like, you know, Southeast Asian to East Asian to Black to just everyone. And, and, and you know, that's the way life it should be, right? That's the way America should be. It's it's Black, Brown, Yellow and White, not just White. And, and unfortunately, because of what we all had to go through, you know, through systemic racism and stuff, a lot of it wasn't touched in our school's education. So a lot of us don't know what happened. Most of my black brothers didn't know about the Chinese. I didn't know about the Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese and urban camps. It was till after school when I researched stuff. So that's like, you know, the innate problem. And for me, we just like on this video and what Paper Tigers just showed by just being Paper Tigers, it's solidarity, man. And it's, we, we can't do this alone. Like we have, we are, you know, the face of America. And, you know, I'm sorry, but those racists just have to deal with it. You know, it's just, for me, you know, it, it's, right, Speak on it. yeah. And it's like, it's, it's very, it's very, it's very, you know, I have to say we've been speaking, you know, on a lot of panels and me, I've been speaking a lot of anti hate panels, but I can't tell you how many black brothers and sisters have come out and say, yo, we're here for you. I'm here for you. One. You know, and, and, and I know, you know, certain certain news stations want to push the agenda of black and brown, hate and yellow, all that stuff. But we have to be smart in that. We have to know, like, reach out to your friends, reach out to your, you know, to our black friends and brown friends and say, hey, you know, it's like Asian Americans aren't blamed for COVID. You know, like, let's really dig the research and all that stuff. But but for me, it's about us coming together as one, because we've all gone through this kind of stuff. And and and, and you know, some of the stuff, it's just. It, it, it has to do with not direct racism, but it could be low education, low income kind of stuff. So there's, there's stuff that we as society have to break down specifically and not group it as one particular thing. And for, for all of us, I think just what Paper Tigers represents, it represents that kind of solidarity that I grew up with. So that's, you know, that's what I have to say about it. I love that. I love that, Ron. And thanks for- hey, yo, and just so y'all know, like, Y'all need somebody to ride with you. You know I'm there, right? <laughs> yeah, we got me for that for, for sure. That's 100%. <laughs> That's 100%. I mean, it's like, yeah, there was mornings when we talked about this, right? Like mornings yeah. to make up, we would have, we would take turns like on our iPhone playing, you know, linking up to the blue. <laughs> and that's when Mikel was just like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> y'all grow up black. I'm like, Bananas, dude, dog. This is like music. So that, crazy. You know, that we love, man. I'm like, for me, I grew up on R&B and hip hop. And, and so, yeah, so we were, we were like, yo, remember this one? Remember this one? Like, we were like, oh, no. so it was just a beautiful thing to start off right at the beginning of the day. We start off with that energy. We had crew, like, dancing to the music, all that stuff. So it was, it was love. It was a lot of love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Ron. And if you guys ever host a sequel for uh, Paper Tigers 2. Speak on it. Speak it in <laughs> it. I know, I know I'm Ron's only it. I know Ron's only a year older than me, but I want to play a younger Ron for a bit. You <laughs> got the hair, so that works. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just messing around. But I do want to focus the conversation back in Bow for a bit. So Bow, like when, as you're creating this. Yeah, script, finally. <laughs> as you, your time to shine now as you, as you creating the script and you were directing everyone and, and casting everyone what was the what was the ultimate vision and dream that you had hopes for paper tigers like what was some of the mission statement and 
the goals and objectives we want to accomplish throughout each iteration of the movie. And what did you kind of hope the viewers would kind of get out of it as mm -hmm. well? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this kind of ties back to kind of what we're talking about. This whole representation is kind of a very broad term, and obviously you can go a lot of different places with it. Uh, I think that what we want to do at, at the end of the day, I just want to have friends on screen, you know, uh, and the martial arts was a vehicle and kind of a reflection of, of like I said, my history. Um, because I think at the end of the day, you know, people are going to relate to that more than say martial arts and martial arts is kind of that vehicle. So I think that's, you know, in its purest distillation, it's kind of like that. And we wanted to have a fun movie. You know, we had looked at Shaun of the Dead as being an example for zombie movies. That's what we want to do for Kung Fu movies or martial arts movies, just to have that freshness, but also loving uh, to the genre. So it's not like a completely de deconstruction or anything like that. Um, but just going back to, you know, what we're talking about, like when we, you know, I had the script that basically reflects, you know, my upbringing and my crowd, my crew of Kung Fu siblings. And they were very diverse. And uh, going back to Bruce, you know, when he first taught here in Seattle, when he was teaching non-Chinese, that was an issue. Um, and even that was a problem, you know, in that period with the elders. Uh, um, so I think back on that when 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 we actually had to start to go pitching the film and, and we had gone around kind of L.A. and Hollywood traditionally, uh, all, all the kind of traditional water bottle tour and just getting all. You know, and then there was interest, but uh, they wanted to change the race of the characters. They wanted to change the, the leads to whites and just kind of make it a more marketable or anything. But it just felt like, you know, that's something that we didn't want to do. It changed what we had set out to make. Um, and, and it just felt like it was changing, you know, what we, you know, the whole fiber of the movie. Uh, so, you know, we kind of went on our way and kind of did it uh, without the support of the studios. But to me, that's kind of like the twofold of it. It's like in the same way that Bruce was told, like, oh, you can't teach non-Chinese people in the same way you can't have people of color starring in your movie. It just felt that same type of exclusion and in a lot of ways that, you know, it felt like the, the battles that we were all fighting are kind of the same. Um, and I, and it was, it's like, we're not activists. <laughs> like I, I would like, we kind of like put into this role. I, we just wanted to tell the story. And I think that's what we always have to kind of go back to and just, focus on what the purpose of the story is as opposed to kind of push an agenda and people are going to feel that if it's an agenda or anything but if your story is honestly to your experience that's the most important because i think people want to go on a journey with a movie and uh be able to um kind of see the world the way the filmmakers see it or the artists see it and i think that's a really important thing because i think with representation, maybe we were in a phase where we had a thing called you know rep sweats where we had to like portray it correctly or almost like we're on pins and needles watching a so-called uh, Asian American show but it's not necessarily written or produced by Asian Americans so we're always kind of like checking if the fact details are right or it's seeing if the things are a little off so there's often like representation police maybe for example there's an example like you know when we kind of look at characters with their shoes in the house you got Asian American characters in the shoes in the house and it feels false right and you find out like, oh, it's like white writers or white directors that are, that have made that. And that's just something that that's a little detail that they they don't pick up on. But I I'd like to think that we're moving into kind of a more uh, open world. We're not we don't have to be that nervous watching on pins and needles anymore because we're we're creating it and we're centered in the story and creating it. Uh, there have been some notes like, for example, like there's a scene with Ron or uh, Hing and Danny in the house and we have them wearing shoes. And I remember on the day I, I told like, you guys are going to wear shoes here. And that was an intentional choice. But you know, we had some, some people were like, well, they're not wearing shoes in the house. That's not accurate. But that let's erase that. I, we're centered here. We're telling a story and we're trying to tell a story about these characters because mm -hmm. Danny and Hing are exactly the types of guys that would wear shoes in the house at this point <laughs> in the story. Right. So, you know, I hope we can kind of like get beyond like that nervousness about getting the details right. And then also getting to the point, what's the story being told? You know, who are, the, you know, that we can actually, you know, use these things to to express these things in the story and, and convey those things. And beyond just kind of like checking the box if things are right or things are, you know, and because that I think that's coming from a position of fear versus the position of kind of creativity. Yeah. Awesome. I will say one thing on, on Bao's behalf, and this is something to to reaffirm for anyone, uh, you know, who's African-American um, and listening to me now, um, this is the kind of respect 
that was it because they they have been misrepresented and because it was so important for him to to have a real representation on screen he wasn't trying to tell me how to be black he wasn't trying to tell me how to react to certain things he wasn't trying to put me in to, to I, you know he he knows i arrived back like and the best thing to do is to is to figure out what works with the piece let me be what who we really are yeah and and you see how it turned out like it was just like i don't think i've ever been given that freedom because i was checking boxes too like i get it i know exactly because i get it from everyone i know like, that ain't real like, we don't do anybody black do that so like i was a little nervous and then i just saw how like he just wanted the truth so like he wanted it to be honestly represented and here's the beauty of that you have to have a compassion for being misrepresented to allow someone else the right to represent themselves. And that is just a small piece of what the black community doesn't understand. Like they get it, bro. You don't have to separate the hate and figure out who's getting it worse. They get it, bro. They get it on all levels and they want the same thing. Mm-hmm. I don't understand what the difficulty is. It's like if we all were in a dark room and you turn the lights out and we all just start talking about, you wouldn't know who was Asian and who was black. Like, it's just not <laughs> an issue. It's a non-issue. I don't know, man. You could be and be like, oh, he has really big biceps. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why. He has put on 75 pounds. And listen, listen, they got biceps everywhere. Don't let them, don't let them fool you. They might be hidden by a little of that uh, little dip sauce, but... They're there. <laughs> I mean, shout out to Bell. I mean, it, I don't think that this this interview really captures like all of like the, the vision and the pressure that you went through. You know, like staying so focused on the goal and making sure this movie about people of color highlighting you know mon- uh, people of minority races. That's highly political in this world that we're just not giving enough light on. You know, so hats off to you for staying so strong because that does affect the politics in the movie. That does affect the marketing it does affect the funding you know so so shout out to you and all the credit and all the flower goes to you man shout out to Bell! <laughs> well you know what it's it's funny like uh, and i thank you and i appreciate it it's it's it always it felt like we knew we were going to have those notes from hollywood but it's in a lot of ways it was it wasn't a hard decision to just go and keep telling your story it was going to be harder to do but i think as artists you know we have a very good bs meter and if something feels false in a story, like it just doesn't sit right. Like you always want to like be truthful with your work. So that was just kind of like one part of uh, the whole cloth of just uh, trying to find what was honest about these characters and, and keep chasing that. Because I think once you you have that as your true north, you know, all the things about the money and, and the funding and the politics of it all, it, it goes away because uh, the, I think the work will stand on its own if, if you kind of keep, keep holding to, to what's true. Definitely. I appreciate that, Bao. And, and I know we're short on time, so we're going to do a fun fire round real quick. So what's one funny scene or memorable scene you guys had during this movie as you're acting, acting through it? Honestly, there's, there's so many. There's so I mean, many. every, it's hard to just, this. you know, the minute Matt Page came on set, I think it just changed the dynamic of everything and just having him having watching Ron Party. and him just go <laughs> at it in the funeral thing. Yeah. I think that was, that was, was that Matt's first day? It was yeah. right. Yeah. That was firework. Like I, I want the producers to put out just the, the extra stuff the that outtakes. went down because <laughs> it's, hilarious. <laughs> so anytime Matt was on set, I thought it was just the funniest funniest day funniest <laughs> moments and matt did a great job as, as playing carter <laughs> yeah he was a really good character you guys yeah shout out to matt, <laughs> matt shout out to master ken for me it was the it was it was master ken in that in that in that in that dungeon when we're like looking for him and it's oh, like okay. and ron's like oh yeah it's in the you can hear it the other master ken the other the master, other master ken. Ken. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Master ken, ken. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's hitting that heavy bag didn't know what Val was doing. So I was really listening, looking and listening. And then 
we hear it and in my mind I know cool ass shit when you when you you know you see it it's like oh this is so cool as soon as I heard I was like oh so yo that was for me it was it was that it was that underground that holds to there out in the alleyway and he's picking up the bike like watching these three guys get themselves into some they wish they hadn't was for me just <laughs> it's hilarious to me yeah awesome what about you Ron oh man <laughs> he said, oh, man. There's a lot of funny stuff. I mean, I feel like I'm always cracking jokes regardless, right? But with the guys, like, we, there were so many uh, tender, funny moments. Um, but yeah, I'll just go back to the, uh, the funeral scene. Because I was thinking, hmm, this would be great. Like, this is definitely, you know, your mama snaps, you know, section, you know? So it's like, so I, I thought back to, and this is with love to um, the white brothers I've, you know, befriended and also met since I was a little kid that got into martial arts. I'm sure Bao probably could attest to this, but, um, and, you know, they come into school wearing the Kung Fu slippers and start talking with the Shaw brothers accent almost because they wanted to be Asian so bad. I'm just like, yo, bro, <laughs> they're like, oh, Yes, Ron. How are you? I'm like, this is like during, I'm just going, uh, so I used to get in crap and I used to like, and I, I, I use that with Matt. Like I just, I just, and, and plus the fact I built up this history that I just, he just really irritated me. Like I grew <laughs> up just hating this dude, you know? And, and for me, uh, it worked well on the funeral scene. I think it caught Matt off guard in the beginning, but then he got into a flow. When he got into a flow, we both just, the snaps just went left and right. And it was like, and we were trying not to crack up because we heard the crew cracking up <laughs> every day. I mean, Elaine, you remember, right? You just, you just hear, oh man. Your crew members, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just like, <laughs> the second but, AC all the way down, everyone's just cracking up. It was just but, so good. It was so much fun, and Matt brought his A game, and then the, the I would say the T scene because it was all three of us with Matt, and it just even with Matt, man, it, it felt like I mean I know there's supposed to be this, but it felt like with the four of us, it was still a brotherhood. It was just three guys that were really irritated with the one guy. So I, I I love the fact when like when I read the script, you know, and Bao wrote like this stuff, it's just like, dude, just speak Chinese, man. I mean, just speak English. And it's just like, cause I, I said those very things, you know, to friends. So, so um, yeah, but I, you know, so those two scenes stand out to me as far as the, the comedy and stuff, but every scene was really joyous. I mean, there's also like when, when you cut the action, we were all just clowning. I love that. You can awesome. really feel the chemistry like during the movie and you know, especially as you guys are talking now, it's like I feel like you guys have a lot of fun on set. Yeah. I feel like I'm watching you guys as you are in the movie because of the brotherhood and the bonding. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I can't wait to you guys look like really fun people to party with and <laughs> with. So we'll set up some time for us, us five or six. <laughs> Bao, what about you? What was your favorite scene? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, again, it's hard to say. I think it's, there's so many moments that basically kind of encapsulate, you know, the pattern and the rhythm of every day on the shoot, because it's like, yeah, it's really hard shooting. It's like, make no bones about it. It was really tough. We, we put them through the ringer and a lot of challenges, but everyone kind of like went with it really chill and, and just kind of believed in it and locked in. And, uh, even though it was hard, we all, you know, had a good sense of humor about it. And I think that was really important. I, you know, I'll, Maybe after the movie and everyone sees, uh, you know, so it's not too spoiler. I can post up some stuff, but I was, you know, there's, I took a lot of videos of these guys singing. They were sitting, you know, <laughs> waiting between takes. So, they're, you know, they're rigging lights. So, you know, these guys are just sitting there listening to music, just like Ron was saying, and just singing and rapping along with everything. And they would just, it would just be in the zone and then the cut on that. And then, you know, once kind of, when it rolls, there's no like sense of like, oh, now we're performing. Like it, they were already in that vibe. And they were already, you know, uh, you know, uh, enjoying each other's company in that sense. So it just has that flow. And it, so it never felt like it ever ended as far as like from from action to cut, you know, and everyone was already in that in that same mode. Oh, I got to see this. Yeah, I just want to say, guys, to put it out there. Uh, I don't know what Bao's putting out, but I can't sing. So please forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got it all. We got it all. Yeah. And even like, you know, like we're saying during lunchtime, you know, they'd be sitting just, you know, world debates about 
best of basketball, hip hop, whatever. And I'd be walking by and just hearing them just <laughs> really go at it passionately. <laughs> oh, that, you know, who is it? Is it Bird? Is it Magic? Is it Jordan? You know, and all this stuff, whatever it was, like, I just heard it all. It was just fun seeing <laughs> that it never turned off. And I think that was like uh, the beautiful thing in that film. I, I didn't say this to Miguel yet, but I won. Uh, yeah. <laughs> John ja Moran was the rookie. John ja Moran. Ah, oh, yeah. John yeah, Moran. Yeah, yeah. Zion Williamson. Yeah, oh, I know my yeah. basketball. I know. I know. I know. Zion was going to find the Asian restaurant. That was. That was a heated. That was a very heated, heated, was a very heated <laughs> debate. Very heated <laughs> debate as to who the, the rookie of the year was going to be. Damn, yeah, but who's, yeah. who's, who's the king right now, though? John ja Moran. Oh, no. No, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, 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 Zion, no, no, no. Zion's killing no, it. No, 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 no. Zion got records next. You know, he taking Charles Barkley yeah. out of the no, I, I, I love Zion. See, I love Zion. see this, 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 this is our, this was our day here. I this love that. Right I want to join this debate yeah. after podcast too, by the way. I have my own opinions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so we are coming out the end of time, man. Uh, we have one final question. How can we find out more about the movie? Mm-hmm. Where can we view the movie? How can we support you guys? Because this is a big step, you know? This is, we want to be there for you guys every step of the way and really amplify the voices. So how can our listeners reach out to you guys or find the movie or, or support in any way? Yes, sir. Well, we'll be on, uh, on theaters, in theaters and on digital uh, coming May 7th. So you can go to the, the papertigersmovie.com or just Google uh, and then you'll be able to follow us on social media. But uh, we'll be in select theaters on May 7th uh, across the country. Of course, depending on however comfortable you feel about going out, uh, we'd love to have you there because we worked really hard on the, on the getting good picture and sound. So it's it's really a crowd movie. And I think that's an experience uh, we'd love for you to have. If not, we also have streaming options. Uh, we'll be all on all the standard uh, Amazon, Google, uh, iTunes, and, and virtual cinemas as well. Uh, so, yeah, you just go to the site. Uh, there'll be all these options that you can check through uh, and check your lo- local listings, of course. So May 7th is when it drops. Come out, support us. It's an indie film. So opening weekend is really important uh, for us to kind of build our momentum into the next uh, following weekends. We don't have, you know, a big studio support. So everything is super plucky and grassroots. So if you like it, share the word, tell your friends and uh, enjoy. <laughs> it looks great in theaters. It looks and sounds great <laughs> in theaters. <laughs> we definitely did. The man has yeah. spoken. <laughs> we'll leave all of that in the show notes so all our, re- our viewers can know about it. Uh, yeah, we'll also leave all your Instagram handles inside yeah. of the show notes as well. Yes. And we really appreciate you guys being on the podcast today. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and you know talking about the movie. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks for Let's having us. You guys. Jen. Let's get it. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to the show. We would like to get to the top 10 on iTunes, so be sure to leave us a five-star review. We release an episode every single Wednesday, so stay tuned. Thank you guys so much.